Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I must say that I am overwhelmed by the warm reception this morning that I did not expect uh, in my wildest dream. I have gotten many awards, many receptions throughout the world, but there is something, not just because it is my country of birth, but there is something in the Indian psyche, Indian culture, that conveys the warmth that will be hard to come by anywhere in the world. In fact, when many of my friends who come from the West to here, to India, I ask them, what do you like about India most? And invariably, they say that, well, the first thing, of course, you get uh, really depressed by the poverty you see on the streets. But once you get over that, the real genuine warmth that is inherent in Indian people comes through. And uh, that's what they carry back. Well, as you know, India is the only country in the world that has a continuous cultural tradition for 5,000 years, almost since the beginning of human, the dawn of human civilization. And we are very proud of that. And there have been invasions, there have been people who have tried to take over India, but fortunately, we have been able to assimilate them. And we are a nation of diversity where everybody, of, no matter what belief they have, what cultural heritage they have, they again feel comfortable and be one. And that was something was preached and brought, brought to the West by Swami Vivekananda, in whose name this hallowed hall where all of you are assembled for this nice gathering today uh, is named. And again, followed by Tagore, of course, after him. And I think the uh, the message that I tried to give to the West has not been lost because you know that this year, I believe, they declared the World Yoga Day. And the World Yoga was first brought to the West by Swami Vivekananda. And of course, it, uh, the way he meant was union of body, mind, and spirit. And uh, yoga that is practiced in the West as of this moment is mostly what we used to call the yogic exercises, not the eventual union of the spirit. But I believe at least we have made a first step in that direction globally and only when they realize the benefit of it, the rest will come. So the, uh, this morning I really feel deeply honored that all of you has come on a work day with, with, with day, uh, to listen to some of my thoughts and I hope you go back and remunerate on that and I hope I can convey something to you that will be useful to think about and useful in your life to make all of our lives better. My job is easier because for not only our tradition, the whole program started with Vedic chanting. So, especially people in India are exposed to it, although we do not think about it, but deep down in our psyche, somewhere, it resonates. The wars of the gifted rishis of the ancient times. Snenantu vishe 
Omritashrutra, implying that we are all part of the immutable, eternal source of the universe. And it has been repeated again and again in various forms, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahma, I am inseparable from Brahma. Not just part, inseparable from Brahma. Tattvamasi, you are also that. Again, they have said that not just you and me, Sarvam Khavigam Brahma, Brahma the source, exists intertwined inseparably with everything, not just you and me, but everything you can see in this universe. Well, this has been the uh, wisdom that has been gleaned through contemplation over yawns, over uh, millennia in this land of India. But today, we live in a scientific society, technological society which has been spawned by science. So, we have to authenticate or rather give support, scientific support to our wisdom that has been handed down to us. Because can you think of life today without your cell phone, with your computer, with your internet, all the gadgets that we use? That's given us some sense of confidence in the method of science. The only thing science cannot do is give you experience. But science does a good job of which experience is right, which experience could be wrong. And in fact, as you know, sometimes people say, what happened to all the theory, all, all the great philosophers of yesteryear? Well, all the, they have become theoretical physicists. They come up with all these theories. In fact, uh, uh, I was in Geneva at CERN uh, in July, and uh, about a month ago, they found an uh, indication of a new particle at uh, about five times the mass of this Higgs particle that they just, uh, invent, uh, discovered there. And within a day, <laughs> there were about 50 papers by theories of what it could be, even though we don't have a definite indi indication that it's there, but they already theorized what it would be. So uh, the theories come up with all kinds of uh, uh, different possibilities. On the experiment, can determine which one is right, the rest of them are going to perish again. So this is why, even though we have started with the truth gleaned from contemplation, trial and error, in fact at the beginning as you know, uh, people didn't know whether there was one God, more than one God, but at the end of it, the Vedanta, uh, they were pretty sure there is no one, one source from which all come from. And can we really anchor that in our scientific worldview today? When I studied physics, uh, the knowledge was not there really. But a man whose, whose intuition really started all of this. He was there, he tried his best to come to uh, the demonstration of that everything comes from one source, scientifically demonstrated. In 2000, the millennium year, the American Physical Society had a uh, survey. Who was the greatest physicist of all times? It was Einstein. Albert Einstein was uh, voted to be the best physicist ever. He himself said, of course, that he was not a mathematician. He said, if you have trouble with mathematics, mine is higher, mine is bigger. And uh, 
he was not even modest actually, mathematically he was not a genius, but intuition, with new ideas that he came up with. Really changed the whole thought process of the scientists. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, when he published his special relativity and E equal MC square, he was a patent clerk. He didn't even have a position as a professor because he was last in his class <laughs> and his professor said, you're a lazy dog, you'll never be anything. If anybody ever tells you that, don't believe it. Because I understand it's proven that, that, uh, uh, that uh, even though he was away from academia and being a patent clerk, and uh, at, at home he was wearing his son in one hand and with a candlelight writing with pencil and paper. Uh, so all his thoughts, all his contemplation actually was very similar to our Yogi Rishi's method. Except that Einstein's ideas now has been verified to a very, very high accuracy. And he's the one who really was responsible for our understanding of modern physics, which started in the 20th century, actually. Uh, he not only came up with the special and general theory of relativity, also he was really initiator and the father of quantum physics. Even though Max Planck came up with the idea of a quantum of energy, bundle of energy, but he thought it was just a mathematical oddity, didn't have any reality behind it. To the Einstein who actually took it seriously and showed that it is indeed a real. And with his uh, push, with his uh, uh, keen interest, he pushed both the two pillars, quantum physics, relativity, on those two pillars that modern physics stands. And it's really amazing to uh, think that uh, near a century ago, we didn't know what the inside of Manhattan looks like. We didn't know if there was another galaxy apart from our own. In the invitation letter you have seen the picture of the galaxy. We are of course in a galaxy similar to that, but uh, the, uh, since we are inside it, we can take a picture of it, but that galaxy that you have seen the picture is actually something very similar to our spiral galaxy outside our galaxy so that we can take a picture of it. But now, with the help of Einstein's intuition and his, uh, with the world society of scientists, we really are fortunate to have a holistic view of what this, uh, at least the material world, is like. We can, with a lot of confidence today, based on the two pillars that Einstein started, say how this whole universe was like when it started, how it developed, and how is it working today. And what is our place in it? And I'd like to share some of those thoughts to you. And you'll see how uncanny it is. This blows your mind that the gifted receipts that cognized the reality, the nature of reality, is to the T similar to what modern physics is finding out. How could it be? Isn't that the Surprising? That's me at least. And that's why I wrote that book, Code Name God, where I've given all the details. I'm sure that uh, I would not be able to give you the perception that I have so far. To me, it's like as true as I see you. But it took me long years to really get to that point. And I'll try my best in this short time to give you an idea how science is showing that 
everything in this universe come from one single source and we are part of it. We are all made of particles. I think in high school you all learn everything is made of atoms, there are 92 atoms, we see the periodic table and uh, uh, what, is it? what are atoms made of? Uh, made of electron, which is a fundamental particle, because you cannot divide that anymore, any further. And of course the electron is, is uh, existing in an atom surrounding, surrounding the proton. Now proton is not a fundamental particle. It's made of other fundamental constituents. You may or may not have heard of it. It's called quarks and gluons. So when you uh, divide anything to the ultimate reality, what you find is we are all made of fundamental particles. You, me, table, chair, everything in this universe is made of fundamental particles. Because we cannot, uh, we call it fundamental because we cannot divide them any farther. But are they really fundamental? We find that for every particle, there is also a antiparticle. Like electron has an antiparticle called positron. When positron and electron comes together, phew, immediately become energy. Einstein is equal to mc squared works. The whole thing become energy. So if something can be easily destroyed like that, how could they be fundamental? That's one question. But furthermore, there's a, even a deeper mystery. Can you really imagine that the electrons in your body, my body, everybody's body, in this chair, and this uh, us, or anywhere in the world, anywhere in the universe, are exactly identical? You cannot tell one from the other at all. No difference. Isn't that amazing? It is a proven fact, a swimmer fact. If anybody can want to, uh, want to do it, they can do it. Uh, any of the labs today. In fact, you can create the electron positron, uh, and no matter where you create, whether in Stanford for a linear accelerator, or whatever, uh, Illinois, the uh, Fermi lab, or uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, or CERN in Geneva, electrons you create in the lab exactly identical. And the electron that has been remaining from the beginning of the universe, what we call Big Bang, and electrons are also produced in uh, astrophysical processes, <coughs> uh, or anything that you see in the lab. No matter when or where they have been created, how they have created, they are exactly identical. Mass, charge, spin, magnetic moment, whatever properties you can think of, exactly identical. And this has been a big mystery to the physicists for a long time. Now we have an answer through the field of quantum field theory. Don't get scared about the name. I'll try to explain to you uh, in simpler term that we give some perception of it. What it says is that any fundamental particle, be electron, quark, or Exposon or any other, they are secondary. They are not this primary reality. The primary objective reality of this universe are what we call quantum fields. What are they? What is a quantum field? Unfortunately, it is only about 20 or 25 years that we have really established uh, the full extent of it. And so much so that most of the physicists even are not fully aware of all its qualities. Only particle physicists who deal with it are more, more <clears throat> familiar with that. But I think that one of the reasons is that it really involves very esoteric mathematics. They are one of the highest uh, mathematics that one can come from this uh, 
rather a hard one with the string theory, but uh, the quantum field theory involves a very exotic mathematics. That's why it's a little hard to really get a full grasp of it. But fortunately, it is possible to convey in a narrative to you, especially the analogy, what, what it is like, even perception. And it is very important for understanding the scientific anchoring of unity of one source, that we everything comes from one source. So please try to get a feeling of it. Now I'll try to do that with an analogy. We are all familiar with a force of gravity, the field of gravity, which is spinning you down on your seat. But you know very well that you cannot see it, you cannot touch it, go out daily life without even thinking its existence, but try to jump, or try to get up your seat, get up from your seat. You'll feel it. We're fortunate that at least we can feel the, uh, what you call manifest field of gravity. Why do I call it manifest field of gravity? Because this is the sort of classical field of gravity, which has a source. Matter produces gravity. So it has to have a source. And second, that it falls off with the distance. Like for instance, if you go away from Earth with a rocket ship, in space you don't feel that gravity. Uh, because it has gradually decreased. It is continuous, and you know, matter is uh, particles and they're separate, but fields are continuous. That's the difference between particles and fields. That, again, let me repeat that. That classical field by gravity is a continuous entity as opposed to matter being uh, metal particles. But this field has two characteristics. One, it has to have material source and it falls off with distance. But what creates matter? That is where quantum fields come. The, they are also fields in the sense that they're continuous and of course abstract, you can see or touch. In fact, we are fortunate to feel the effect of gravity, but only feels we have no way of uh, perceiving in, in, a, uh, in our sensory way. But mathematically and through scientific experiment, we can show that it is really objectively real. It is the ultimate objective reality as of now that we know. You have to remember the science is a always professional. Uh, it could be superseded by other ideas, uh, other more fundamental reality. But it would not be thrown away. It would, have, it would have to, any theory, new theory has to make room for it. And in fact, I should say that uh, there are various quantum field theories. Uh, in fact, we do not even call them th a theory because they're more of a framework. The definition of a theory is when it is mathematically consistent and it can predict results that can be verified. And so particular part of quantum field theory, what we call the quantum field theory of standard model of particle physics, is something that has been established almost beyond doubt. It's through so too many experiments and too many uh, uh, predictions have been verified and just like periodic table of elements, we have a periodic table of elementary particles, and all of them nicely fits with this quantum field theory of standard model of particle physics, except for gravity. Um, gravity is not been incorporated yet, and that is the forefront of uh, research in particle physics as well as high energy physics, which Professor Rose is uh, one of the uh, participants. Um, uh, so, I, I believe that it's just a matter of time. 
I have not met any physicist uh, who doesn't believe that we will actually get quantum gravity into this uh, scientific uh, paradigm of today. Actually, string theory does uh, have gravity on it, it combines everything. But for, unfortunately, it has embarrassment of riches because it cannot predict one single th uh, uh, prediction that can be verified. So the biggest push now is how to connect string theory to quantum field theory of a standard model uh, so that we'll have a theory which will show that all of these particles, forces, they're uh, coming from one single source. I, I'm trying to scratch my brain to see how we could uh, convey this to you. Maybe I should say you know, what, has, what has been done, for example. We all know about the electromagnetic unification. During the Greek time, they knew there was magnetism. They also knew there was electricity. But they did not know that one is associated with the other. In fact, they can be combined into what we call electromagnetism. Because if you have a moving magnetic field, magnetic magnetic uh, pole, for example, it will create um, electricity. That was shown by Faraday. And that gives the idea of the field at the time, the classical field. And now it has been pretty much well established that electricity and magnetism are really different aspects of the same uh, uh, field, the electromagnetic field. The next step came when another field called, we call weak field, which is inside the nucleus, it is actually not very weak, is weak in our perception because you cannot get out of the nucleus. Its range is only 10 to the minus 16 centimeter, much 10,000 times smaller than the nucleus. It may be weak, but without that, we would not exist because the sun's energy is what sustains us one way or another. Uh, the food we eat has been manufactured by sun's rays through the chlorophyll into vegetables and, uh, and they have been eaten by the fish or any other meat we eat. So the eventual source of energy is the sun, even today. We use fossil fuel which have been stored, of course, but without sun, there will be no energy and we will not exist. And sun cannot produce that energy without that weak force. So there is a extremely different characteristic of the electromagnetic field and the weak field. To begin with, electromagnetic field can go from one end of the universe to the other. Uh, the photons that we are seeing today from the beginning of the universe, we uh, started by 14 billion years ago. Uh, they have been traveling all this time and we can see them through the telescope. So they can go from one end of the universe to the other. But the weak field cannot even get out of the nucleus. This <coughs> uh, field of activity is inside. So how could they be really united? How could they be coming from one source, what we call electro-weak force? But theorists came up with the idea that this is how they can be combined. And for that, of course, they got Nobel Prize. <coughs> And a few years later, if there is a field, there is always a particle associated with it, because the excitation of the quantum field is a particle. Uh, they, they realize that uh, indeed the particle predicted by the theorist for the electroweak unification, what we call the W and Z bosons, they actually exist, and they got Nobel Prize for that too. And when the physicists realize that such diverse forces can be actually coming from one single source, uh, that really breaks the barrier in their mind that indeed everything else, even though they're so diverse, 
they can be actually coming from one single source. So far we have a theories of combining, how to combine a strong force with that, and at the same time you can combine all the bosons and the fermions as a group. And so the final push towards the unification is how to combine gravity and all the bosons and all the fermions. And everybody, every physicist has a gut feeling that in, in not too distant future we'll be able to do that. So that part uh, I think uh, is, although not fully established, but the way it is going, there is very little doubt that we'll be able to show that everything material, at least everything material, in this universe comes from one single source. And that source is the, uh, through the quantum field theory, is uh, uh, it, it is, the, is the way that we, we, we unite these uh, forces. And again, remember, the quantum fields are not only responsible for material particles like electron or quarks or any other material particle, they also are responsible for the force particles. So, in the eyes of the quantum fields, there is no difference between particles and forces. Uh, that's why we need the quantum fields and that's why quantum field has been able to show how to unite everything in this universe. So, I don't know by this time whether I have been able to convey to you uh, that really if you look uh, very deep into it, you will see that everything in this universe, including us, everything physical, that is, at least at this point, come from one single source. More interestingly, that source exists everywhere. There is not a, uh, the, uh, and that source not only really exists everywhere, it is exactly the same everywhere. That classical field falls off, and it needs a material atom body to produce it. But quantum fields are the primary object. They're not made of anything else. They, they can be in vacuum, where that nothing, where eyes, our eyes see nothing. And, uh, but that's where all the machinery, all the power, uh, all the blueprint for everything is there. And it is exactly the same magnitude immutable, eternal, since the very beginning of time, throughout the whole universe. And these are not just my words, these are all proven facts that anybody can verify if they wish to. And so, um, now that I hope you have understood the tiny districts of our universe, I'd like to take you on a mental tour of, to give you some idea of how vast this universe is. I could tell numbers to you, well this physical universe up to the, what we can see is 93 billion light years. Light would take 93 billion from one end to the other, the diameter of the physical universe. Those are numbers, doesn't mean, mean anything, doesn't give you any perception. I'd like to give you some perception. Uh, why do we use light? Because the distances are so much, so much, so big, that we have to use the velocity of light to measure the distances in the cosmic scale. Uh, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Again, that's a number, it doesn't probably mean anything. The, the uh, you know, but when I tell you that, that means in one second and one, this short period of one second, uh, light can go about eight times around the world. And that's hard to perceive here. But this, the fastest speed that we perceive is when you're on a jet plane, 
And even in a continuously flying on a jet plane, it takes you about a day and a half to go around the world. But light can do that only a tenth of a second. Flick of an eye, the flick of eye, lights are gone around the world. That fast. That fast it goes. I hope that gives you some perception how fast the light is. And so, just to give you some perception, if you ever look up the night sky sometimes, in a clear night, uh, you'll be able to see Jupiter, the largest planet of our uh, solar system. The light that you saw started actually 45 minutes ago, and after covering half a billion miles, just coming to us to, uh, right now, just to begin with, in our, in our <coughs> uh, solar system. Let's go out a little bit farther out of the solar system. In, you can see the constellation of Orion, the hunter with uh, three bright stars arranged in an exact straight line that almost jumps at you in the night <clears throat> that's on the belt of the Orion. How many of you have seen Orion in the night? Yes. Uh, if you have to go outside the city lights, of course, but when you go, I remember when I went to something that happened 25 years ago when it was not as built up I was amazed to see, almost you could touch it. Yeah. In fact, I grew up in a village where uh, I used to see them in the night travel. And strangely strange enough, <laughs> I always thought, if I have to devote my life to something, it would be nice, it would be wonderful to see who, what are these heavenly bodies are, and what are the mystery, where they come from. And uh, I, I'm fortunate that my wish has, has been success, uh, has come to be true, true. And uh, that's why I wrote the book called Cosmic Detective, meaning when the universe started, none of us were there, so how do we know what happened? But fortunately, nature has left telltale evidence that you can pick up and use Einstein's general theory of relativity to run the frame backwards to see what exactly happened. And uh, this is what modern cosmology is about, and that's why I call it cosmic detective, because uh, we were never, not there when we were starting. So, but fortunately we have dealt with evidence like Sherlock Holmes, and uh, you know, you can pick up those evidence and use Einstein's uh, relativity theory and go back and see what happens all, all the way through. <clears throat> to, to get back to give you an idea of how, the, how big the universe is. So, if you look at Orion, there are three other painter stars which forms the belt. I mean, which is hanging from the belt forms the sword. The middle object in the sword, you can see by your own bare eyes, it looks like a, f a fuzzy star. But actually, it is the famous Orion Nebula, which is consisting of a cluster of about 2,000 stars and a very active star forming in our city. But the light, as we just saw, started 1400 years ago. Just to give in perspective, you know, the British landed here in Calcutta only 300 years ago, and they, ruled, they come, you know, took, took, took over the rest of India in about a very short time, and ruled India for 200 years. Now they become free and now it's a bustling country on its way to become the la one of the largest economy in the world. Mere 300 years. Mere 300 years ago, America became free and became the la richest uh, nation, richest country uh, in the world. So 300 years is nothing. Think of 1400 years ago. That's when the Roman Empire uh, disintegrated and Europe heading to the dark ages. Then now uh, Europe is flourishing. But uh, again, coming back to India, you know, thousand, even a thousand years ago when Sankara was uh, teaching his wisdom of Vedas, traveling barefoot all over India, and something that we'd be very proud of, 1400 years ago, here in India, the most important numeral was invented, a zero. Zero is the most important numeral 
in all of science and mathematics. Without zero, there will be no computer, there will be no uh, uh, algebra, geometry, uh, uh, calculus, and all that. Um, that was 1400 years ago, the Gupta period. During you know, all this historical period, just in your mental journey, trying to think, going at the speed of tenth of a second around the world at that speed, coming from 1400 years ago, light coming from something that you can see with the bare eyes. It's, it's, it's like you see anything else with the bare eyes, you can see that Orion Nebula. Yet the photon that you're seeing has been alive for 1400 years and coming to us today after traveling at that high speed. So it gives you some idea of how far it is. And then now you can go to outside of our, uh, our uh, galaxy. Our nearest galaxy is Andromeda and the light from there that we just saw, we can actually see it if your eyes are good or you can use a small binocular next to the constellation of Cassiope, uh, uh, the uh, Cassiope, the W side, say, uh, you will see faint patch of light, and that's from our nearest large galaxy, Andromeda. The light that you're seeing today started two and a half million years ago. Again, to give you a perspective, our hominid ancestor, Homo habilis, just barely human, they were were foraging around in Eastern Africa in a temperate zone two and a half million years ago. In two and a half million years they developed the human, modern human, and uh, spread through the entire earth and brought this modern civilization. Now all these two and a half million years light has been coming at the speed of tenth of a second around the world. For two and a half million years, can you imagine, just, just try to let your mind fly and fancy and how far is it? It's just mind-boggling. It's really unimaginable. If that's not enough, let me tell you that there are another at least 200 billion such galaxies homogeneously distributed in a larger scale of the visible universe. By visible universe I means as far as light has come, reached us, and I can, we can see how far it is. Universe is bigger than that, but at least what we see is what we call physical universe. And that is what I just said before, that is 93 billion light years in diameter. In that large scale, the entire supercluster of uh, global cluster, supercluster of galaxy that were part of our Milky Way, uh, the Andromeda, and tens of thousands of other galaxies, all of that almost is imperceptible, imperceptible. You can hardly see it in the larger scale of the physical universe. That gives you some idea, I hope, how unimaginably vast this universe is. And now, the most interesting fact is that the source of everything is present in each element of space-time, each uh, nook and cranny of this whole entire universe, and they're exactly the same and they haven't changed at all. They're immutable, immortal, just like our Rishi said, through cognition. Isn't that amazing? And to, uh, I, I think, again, to give you an analogy, we're pretty familiar with our a genome, the, when we were born with a single cell, it is so small that you cannot even see it with your eyes. But in it is the blueprint of the entire human being that you are put together by itself without any help from anybody else. It has the intelligence to put together. And yet, those same genes is present in each cell as demonstrated by the first cloning of Dolly the ship, you can clone uh, the whole body from each shell because it has the contingent of the whole uh, DNA. And so is the universe, in a way, repeated. Uh, we have repeated that uh, pattern. The universe is so vast that you have not tried to give you an idea, but 
each an element, each element of space-time has exactly the same blueprint, the same source, everywhere throughout this universe and always. And that source is intertwined in your existence because you are a metal particle, I am a metal particle, the chair, table, everything you see are made of nothing but particles. And they are coming from quantum fields. Those quantum fields are immutable, eternal, same, exactly the same throughout the universe. What does this mean? It means that I feel I'm separate, you feel you're separate, but we have an inner connection, an invisible connection, because we are coming from the same source. We might have the same electron. Your electron is not different than mine, or, or yours, or, or the table, actually. So, science is coming a long way from our beginning when the, everything was supposed to be separate, but now we realize that really, indeed, as our receipts are cognized through contemplation, everything is coming from one single source that is present everywhere in our world. So, if I say something to you, it might sound silly, uh, but it is scientifically correct. Would you believe if I say, you are the center of the universe? Sounds, sounds bombastic, sounds uh, look like, uh, you know, uh, something hard to believe. But at the same time, if I say, so are you, so is everybody. Everybody is the center of the universe because according to general theory of relativity, there is no preferred center of the universe. Every point in the universe is exactly the same way, behave the same way. When it's expanding, each point is expanding, not from, from a central point. So it is perfectly scientifically correct to say that you are the center of the universe. And the universe is not complete without you. And the source is always with you. If we can understand this, that is our connection of all human beings, all with our nature, with the universe. That will give you the right perspective of our place in this cosmos. Now, I don't know, how much time do I have? <laughs> Five, ten minutes? Okay. Um, one thing science has not come up with yet. Where does our awareness fit into this? Where does consciousness fit into this? We have done a very good job of showing that everything physical at least comes from one source. A lot of research are underway, but we still need a breakthrough in that regard. The first breakthrough really was done by, or first I should say, most physicists, uh, since they have no clue where awareness comes from, it was almost like a closet in the, you know, consciousness was a closet in the physicist's closet. But uh, with the prestige of Sir Brother Penrose uh, behind it, and with his two books, seminal books, Emperor's New Mind, Shadows of the Mind, he gave very convincing argument that awareness cannot come from computation or is not an emergent property. It's a fundamental property of the universe. But how? How is it connected to our own awareness?